Howdy and welcome to the 10 Week Bible Study. This is week nine, day four of our study of Mark. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're talking about Mark 14, 43 through 65. Welcome back to the 10-week Bible study. Again, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs. Would you join me as we pray before we start today? Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us, God. Speak to us and fill our hearts with the knowledge of you. We want to know you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, let's jump into God's word. We'll be reading today from the NIV. This is Mark 14, starting in verse 43. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off of his ear. I want to pause right there before we get into Peter cutting off the guy's ear. I I find this very strange. I've I've always found this strange. And I've, I've read a bunch of different things, trying to figure out what exactly was going on here because it doesn't seem like when you've got this detachment of soldiers with you and you're leading them to Jesus and you show up, it doesn't seem like you need to go up and kiss the guy, right? This th- There's something else going on here. Maybe it's, it's, it's Jesus has kind of set all this up in Judas's mind, kind of pressed him into this since he he's given himself to this, that he wanted to be betrayed with a kiss in this way. But it, it it's kind of odd I mean, because you Judas very well could have walked up and pointed at Jesus. That's him. Get him right. I mean, why? Why the pretense of this? What? What was all of this about? And and I've never been able to come up with anything. I I, I really don't fully understand why. And I've read cultural things and this and that. But I mean, really and truly, like regardless of culture, he could have just walked up and from a distance said, "That's him. Get him." Um, or it's the. Jesus, that guy right there, you know, none of the rest of them, he's going to claim it's just that guy. Just go get him. Right? I mean, it's that simple. It's that simple. And so this, this kiss, this is such a strange thing. And I think this is, I think this is an orchestrated by God kind of thing. I think this is, this is where we see that Jesus, you know, he says very clearly that no one takes his life. He's freely given it. This kiss doesn't make any sense. I think this is a setup. I think the Lord is, in this way, Judas made his choice, but I think in this way he set him up with this signal. I didn't need a signal. I mean, this is this is you know like kids playing espionage. Like they need you know signal. I think of. <laughs> I go back to this from time to time, and some of you have enjoyed this at least. So I'll I'll mention this. You know, in in the movie. Um, the three amigos, there's the scene where, where the three amigos are breaking into the Hollywood movie studio that has their costumes because they need to get them. And there's this moment where Steve Martin is, is giving the bird call signal to the guys to tell them it's okay to come on over the wall. And he's standing on top of the wall doing this ridiculous set of bird calls as the top of his lungs. And then the, the camera pans back and they're separated by three feet. You know, he's on top of the wall and if they just stood up, they're basically right there with him. And it, it seems like that, right? This is a signal that doesn't even need to happen. This is, this is almost bizarre. It's almost comically bizarre. And that makes me think that Jesus, Jesus set this up so that he would be betrayed by one of those closest kissing him on the cheek. I think that was a symbolism that he wanted for this moment. Verse uh, 47. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off of his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching the temple courts and you did not arrest me. The scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. Um, I find it interesting that Mark doesn't mention specifically this is Peter. And we know from the book of John that it's Peter. John and Peter are obviously closer than Mark and Peter would have been. So I almost wonder if there's just a little bit of that real world interaction going on here when Mark is writing this. John, you know, I I almost wonder in in Mark, you know, he was not necessarily 
we'll get into in a second, not necessarily an eyewitness to this or anything else that went on. So he's interviewing a lot of people about all of the things that happened. And he's a younger guy. He's not one of the disciples. We know that Mark um, came along later and uh, when he was young, traveled with Paul and Barnabas and then left. And and that he's actually related to Barnabas in some way, but then um, you know abandons them on their first missionary journey. When it comes time to go to the second one, Mark comes back, says, I'm sorry, I want to go with you. And Mark, you know, Paul doesn't want him to go. Paul doesn't really forgive and forget. Barnabas is like, no, he's coming with us. And they actually disagree so strongly over Mark that Paul and Barnabas split. And Paul takes Silas with him on his future journeys and Barnabas takes Mark. And and so this is this is that same Mark. Um, it almost makes you wonder as he's doing the interviews here, maybe he's a little nervous about pointing out Peter. Maybe Peter is is uncomfortable with this story being told. I think it's very likely because Mark doesn't tell the story here, but we know that Jesus picks the ear up and puts it back on the guy and heals him, right? I have very high confidence of all of the Romans. And well, actually this guy's in a Roman. He's a, he's a, a temple guard. He's Jewish. So uh, I, I have very high confidence, of all of the Jewish people, all of the people that get saved in the new Testament, that this guy is probably one of them. And so he's probably um, in their numbers, right? So Mark has the opportunity to, to interview this guy and Peter. And maybe Peter is probably years later, still a little embarrassed, you know, when he sees them, when they're, when they're having functions, you know, in Jerusalem at the church together. And Peter sees this guy that cuts ear off. He's like, Oh yeah. Hey, you know, uh, sorry about that again. You know, I'm glad Jesus healed you. Um, still a little embarrassed about that every time I see you. I mean, there's gotta be something like that. I mean, this is real world, real people. There's gotta be some kind of ongoing emotions from that. I wonder if that's why Mark left this out. So it's an important point, but Mark, interestingly enough, leaves Peter out of it. Uh, so everyone runs, everyone runs. And now Mark is going to point out someone specifically that's uh, very odd. And it's something that none of the other gospels point out. Verse 51, a young man wearing nothing but a linen, linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Uh, most people think that this is Mark talking about himself, <laughs> that he was actually there, that Mark was, I mean, he doesn't say it's him, but this really, really sounds like this is Mark. Right? He would have been a young man at this time. Um, maybe he snuck out of his mother's house or whatever, and he's just got his his pajamas on, his linen garment. And when when the guards go to grab Jesus and there's this crazy fury and all the disciples are running because they don't know what's going on. It's like they're getting out of there, even though they said they never would. And there's this young man, probably wasn't privy to all the upper room stuff. Maybe he was, who knows, but he's just got a linen garment on and they grab him by the linen garment and he, you know, ditches this thing and he takes off running just buck naked. Right. And so, um, kind of a funny, you know, image in the midst of all of this that funny in the sense that there's a guy literally running naked away from this thing intense in, in, in understanding like that's just how intense this moment was that someone was willing to run away naked in the night to escape what's going on here. <clears throat> I think there's a very high likelihood that Mark is talking about himself here. This is almost kind of like a wink, wink, nod, nod, uh, ask me about who this actually was and, you know, sit down, buy me coffee. Maybe I'll tell you who this was kind of thing. Obviously Mark is much older now when he's writing this book, <clears throat> but it, it, it certainly seems like that's, that's what he's talking about here. Verse 53, they took Jesus to the high priest and all of the chief priests, the elders of the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. So they're looking for something uh, on the level of blasphemy, specifically is what they're looking for. There's not just a whole lot of things that someone can say in uh, Jewish tradition that they were allowed to 
put them to death for. The death penalty was reserved for a few very specific things. And so they're trying to come up with something here. I mean, they're kind of, uh, was it Joseph Stalin or Lenin said, you know, show me the man and I'll tell you the crime kind of thing. That's what they're trying to do is like, just bring me the guy and we'll come up with something that he's deserving of death, right? They don't have a specific charge against them. They're just going to work until they can find something is what's going on here. But even the people that are testifying, like they can't even get their stories straight. So it's like, even as much as they want them dead, they've got, they're just on thin ice. They can't make this work. Verse 57. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands and in three days will build another not made with hands. Yet even their testimony did not agree. Right? So according to the Jewish scriptures and the Jewish law, you can't put someone to death unless by two or three witnesses. And those witnesses actually need to agree. Like the witnesses can't see different things. They have to see the same thing. They have to come up with the same thing. And so they're saying this stuff, but it's like, you know, their stories, they don't jive. They don't jive. They don't understand. They obviously, Jesus said something like what they're saying, but you know, he's, he's, they're not understanding what he said. And so they're getting the whole quote wrong and they, they can't get all of this straight. They don't understand any of it. Verse 60. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. That had to make them so mad. That had to have made them so incredibly mad that he's just sitting there silent. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. Continuing on. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Verse 62, I am, said Jesus, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. I want to point out, this is really only the second time, maybe the the third, depending on how you're counting in scripture, that Jesus has ever said this, ever. I mean, this is such a big deal that he just says this very plainly. He said this very plainly once to to Peter, and actually Peter said it to him, and he's like, you know, you're, Peter says, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. He's like, you're right, Peter, but let's keep that under wraps for right now. He says it once to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, and he basically acknowledges it here. It's kind of a big deal that if you're the Messiah, that you aren't proclaiming it from the rooftops. That's one of the things that they kind of expected as a Messiah to come and be very obvious. And I mean, like, I am the Messiah, join my army kind of thing. Thought there'd be some recruitment going on, things like that. It's not what Jesus did. And so there's, they're thinking that because he's not leading this military rebellion, even by virtue of him acknowledging it, that he thinks he's the Messiah, that would be blasphemy enough for 63. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. They meant, Prophesy, tell us, you know, who hit you. This is kind of a low moment for these guys. Really, really low moment for them. And the problem here is I suppose this would be blasphemy. To claim that you're the Messiah if you're not. And the problem for them is that he actually is the Messiah. They bind him, and they beat him, and they're going to hand him over to be killed. Not a fake Messiah. The actual, honest-to-God Messiah. For the 10-Week Bible Study, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and I can't wait to see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the 10-Week Bible Study. If you've enjoyed this, would you consider doing that whole like and subscribe and bell thing you're always hearing people talk about? It really helps other people find out about the show, and my heart is for people to fall in love 
with God's word. Thank you. <laughs>